Welcome to the Central Church YouTube channel. We hope that today's message blesses you in some way. Consider subscribing and hitting the notification bell to stay current with all the content we put online. Thanks again for being with us, and remember, you are loved at Central. Uh, was this last week, as Brent said earlier, it was a, a great week, and you might have seen some things on that video and wondered, what in the world were they doing? Um, and I'm here to tell you, I have no idea. <laughs> I do not know. Uh, but it was a great time. The Lord did great things. Um, I'm so grateful for Pastor Mike and the whole team uh, that made Staycation happen. Absolutely. Uh, they were here late last Sunday, uh, turning the church into uh, a student camp, uh, and then they stayed late Friday after all of the kids had left uh, to make it look not like a student camp. And so uh, I'm grateful for all of the work that they did. Um, if you see an adult with one of these black shirts on that says, to the ends of the earth, uh, make sure that you uh, tell them thank you. And if it looks like they're nodding off in the sermon, they have earned it, all right? They were here uh, all week. So uh, if you have a Bible, go ahead and meet me in Exodus chapter 20. Uh, Exodus chapter 20 is where we're going to spend our time together this morning, and we're going to look uh, just at one verse this morning. We're going to look at uh, verse 7. Uh, last week, we started uh, really a summer sermon series called Words from the Fire, where uh, we are taking some time uh, to just walk slowly through the Ten Commandments, commandment by commandment, uh, to see what the Lord would say to us through those commands, and then also to see uh, how does Jesus inform, how does uh, Jesus speak to these commands, because we know he has told us that he did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. Uh, and so we are here uh, to see how Jesus does that. Uh, in the state of Florida, you have five days to file a birth certificate after uh, the birth of your child. And now, uh, for some of you, that seems like really quick, right? Uh, man, five days. Uh, for others of you, uh, it seems like, why do you need that long? Well, uh, it's so that you can decide on a name for your child. Uh, me and my family, uh, when we were uh, naming each of our kids, we had the names picked out uh, way in advance. But I have friends who, uh, she is in labor, and they are trying to decide what are they going to name this kid, right? Uh, and that might be you. And if that's you, uh, that is great. And uh, we know really what a big deal a name is for a child. In fact, also in the state of Florida, you have up to a year to change the child's name with no penalty as long as both parents agree. Because we understand just what a big deal, uh, how important a name is. A, a name means something, right? A, a name represents something, and so we take great care uh, in choosing a name. Well, just as with us, God's name means something. And as we look here at Exodus 20, we're going to see just how important, just how holy God's name is. And as we look here at verse 7 of Exodus 20, we see this truth. This is really what's behind uh, this command, that we cannot separate God's name from God's glory. We cannot separate God's name from God's glory. Look with me here at verse 7 of Exodus 20. Let me invite you to stand as we honor the reading of God's perfect and precious word. And uh, we did this in the first service. I'm going to invite you to uh, do it here. Would you read this with me? Starting here in verse 7, we read this. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord your God will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. This is God's word. You can be seated. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for your name that is holy. Father, thank you for your glory. And Father, we pray now that you would speak to us through your word. Father, we pray that we would love your name and we would love your glory and that you would help us to do just that uh, through our time together. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. We cannot separate God's name from God's glory. And as we think about that truth, in verse 7 here in this passage, we see this first, that God takes God's name seriously. 
that God takes God's name seriously. If you were here last week, then maybe you remember that we talked about that the Ten Commandments are really divided into two tables, is the way we can think about it. Uh, the first table is the first four commands that deal with uh, our relationship with God, and the last six commands make up the second table, uh, which deal with our relationship with one another. And last week, we, we looked at the first two commands, that you shall have no other gods before me, and you shall not make any idols, and we saw that God is great. This week, we see in this command that God is so great that even his name is to be honored. Even his name is to be revered. Now, as we look at this third commandment, we can separate it into two parts. First, we have the command, and then second, we have the promise. And the command is simple. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Now, that word take, it's this idea of lifting up. So it's a, it's a prohibition. It's the Lord forbidding against lifting up the name, his name, in vain. His name is something that is worthless or something that is common or something that is simple. In the Hebrew world, much like our world today, a name carries a reputation. This is the reason we protect our names. This is why you will hear parents tell kids as they run onto the field that the name on the back of the jersey is more important than the name on the front of the jersey. Right? Maybe, maybe your parents have said something like this to you. My dad used to tell me you're a crowd or make me proud. Because names carry with it a reputation. We understand that. This is a reason why we go into the church nursery and there's not a lot of Judases or Adolphs running around. right? Because we understand that the names mean something. Names carry something. They represent something. They signify something. They communicate something. And it's no different than God's name. In fact, the name God is as much of a title as it is a name. See, by his name, God is revealing something to us. He's communicating something to us. In fact, that's why these 10 commandments are so important because they're teaching us something about God. They're, they're teaching us something about ourselves. And specifically in these first three of four commands, what we have is we, God, we have God revealing who he is and what he is like. We've got communicating to us what his nature is. And we see here that his nature is so great. His nature is so holy. He is so glorious that even his name isn't to be trifled with. Uh, Herman Bavink, he he was a a theologian. He wrote this. He said, we don't name God. God names himself. That God's name wasn't the, the thinking or the imagination of a group of people. It wasn't that Israel came together and said, well, what should we call him? No, when Moses asked the Lord, who should I say sends me? Do you remember what he said? I am, right? I am sends you. God names himself. His name sums up his entire character and person. And when we use his name, we, we bring his reputation and his power into any situation in which we are speaking. This is why he takes his name seriously. When God's name is used vainly, what we're doing is we are disconnecting his name from his presence and his power. We can think of it like this. Whenever we use God's name in vain, we disconnect it from his presence and his power. And so what that means is that we are robbing him of his identity, right? We are stealing his identity. Using his name vainly treats who he is as common. See, God takes God's name seriously. And I think maybe one of the most clear places we see this in the New Testament is in the Lord's Prayer. Do you remember Jesus teaching the disciples to pray and what the first petition, the first thing that Jesus teaches his disciples to pray? Do you remember what it was? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. That there's something important about the name of our God. Now, Jesus prays, Hallowed be your name. What does it mean to hallow something? It means to make it holy. So, Jesus isn't praying that God's name would become holy. Instead, Jesus is praying that the world would see God's name for what it is. Because he understood this that, that the way we see a name is the way that we see a person. 
And so the way that we see God's name is the way that we see God. What that means is the way that we treat God's name is the way that we treat God. The, the way that we treat God's name reveals how we think about God and, and what we believe about God. It's interesting here that the first thing that Jesus teaches us to pray teaches us something about God's name. And when we take God's name in vain, we hinder that prayer. See, we should only use his name when we're showing him as holy and as mighty and as strong and as great and as powerful. Think back to Exodus 6. We've already said God, God reveals himself to Moses by saying, I am. Moses says, who shall I say sent me? Tell them that I am sent me. See there, God connects his name with his activity. I am the one who saves. I am the one who redeems. I am the one who delivers. I am the one who creates. That, that God's name and his person are tied up with his activity. And so to count God's name as vain is to count his activity as vain. To count God's name as common is to count what God does as common or as normal or as regular or as ordinary. And I'm here to tell you this this morning, that there is nothing ordinary about our God. That there is nothing tame about our God. And so we should use his name only to show how great and how wonderful and how mighty and how holy he is. So we see that God takes God's name seriously. Next we see this, that we should take God's name seriously. We should take God's name seriously. The the first half of this verse is a command. Well, the second is the promise. The first is what not to do. And the second is why not to do it. And we know that all throughout scripture, there are promises that God gives to his people. I will neither leave you nor forsake you. Right, that I'm, he's working all things together for good for those who have loved him and who are called according to his purpose. So we find a great comfort and great rest in the promises of God. But here's what we should understand is that God's promises aren't only for blessing, but they're also for judgment. They also, they serve as comfort for us, but then they also serve as a warning. And so this promise that we see here in verse seven, it's a promise that no one wants. Look there at verse seven. He says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. So there's, there's a couple of options, a couple of reasons why this commandment is seen here. In fact, all of the commands, and especially the first four commands, they're really, what they're doing is they're teaching us and they're speaking to another situation. And so last week we saw that the reason that the Lord says, you shall have no other gods before me is because he's showing that all of the false gods of the nations are worthless. The reason he says you shall, have, uh, you shall not make for yourself a carved image is because the nations were, were consumed with making idols. Here he says you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain because that's what the nations do. That, that's what Israel's neighbors would do. They, they wouldn't just take the, the God of Israel's name in vain, but they would take their own God's names in vain. So uh, there, were, uh, there were two things happening behind this command. One is that this was a prohibition against entering into an oath using the Lord's name when you have no intention of keeping that oath. So it's a prohibition of the Lord saying, don't say that I I swear to God I will do this if you have no intention of keeping it, which teaches us as well that maybe we should be really careful about saying I swear to God flippantly. Maybe we should be really careful about saying I swear to God when what we mean is I'm serious. But there's, a, there's another thing happening here that the other nations, they would use their false gods' names when they wanted something accomplished. So they would use their names as if there was something magical or mystical about them. What the Lord is doing here is he's saying, don't think that I'm a lucky rabbit's foot. Right? Don't think that I exist as a lucky charm. I'm not here to just do your bidding. I'm here as the high king of heaven, the Lord of the universe who we respect and who we honor and who we revere. Now, both of these are still things that are dangerous for us today. Now, maybe, maybe you're not in danger. Or maybe you don't regularly make oaths. Maybe when you do, maybe you don't take the name of the Lord in vain whenever you do it. Maybe you don't say, I swear to God, or or something along those lines. But how many of us take the name of Christ as Christians, and yet we fail to live as Christ? Or maybe we, we take the name of Christ as Christians, and really, we have no intention of living as Christ. 
We have no intention of honoring who he is and what he has done. See, when we, we call ourselves Christian, we're saying that we belong to Christ. We're saying that Christ has worked in us and through us and is changing us. And so whenever we, we take that name and we fail to live to honor him, we're taking his name in vain. When we take his name and we say, I, I'm going to be a Christian and that's going to change my eternity, but it's not going to change my right now, then we've missed the point. We've missed what God is doing and what he wants to do in us and through us, and we blaspheme who he is. That second, the second reason behind this command that the other nations were using their false God's names when they, they wanted to accomplish something, there's a it's almost like there's magic here. Now, you might say, Ethan, I, I might not practice magic. I, I know a few card tricks, but I'm not a, I wouldn't call myself a magician. Maybe, maybe you're not tempted to engage in practicing magic. But how often do we approach prayer in God's name as something that makes magic happen? We use prayer in God's name when we're in a pinch rather than as a constant source of strength. I've been there. I think the clearest example I can give you is walking into a math test in high school or college knowing good and well I have not studied and praying, Lord, help me to remember everything I don't know. <laughs> help me to remember everything I did not study. Help me to remember everything that I did not care about until I sat down at this desk. And I was praying that, that magic would happen. Now, the Lord can do anything, right? But I'm here to tell you, he didn't answer that prayer. <laughs> uh, uh, it, it, that didn't happen. But we take God's name in vain when we only call out to him when we suddenly need him rather than recognizing that we always need him. Right, that, that sometimes we approach prayer and we approach God's name as, Lord, I'm coming to you because I've tried everything else. Well, when we come to God after trying everything else, what we're showing is that we don't understand who God is. When we come to God after trying everything else, then what we're saying is, God, I don't think you're strong enough to do it. I think I'm a little stronger than you. And so, God, I'm coming to you now, though. Right, Lord, I want you to move. I want you to act now. The truth is, is that we always need God. We always need his grace. We always need his mercy. We always need his strength. See, we take God's name seriously because if we don't, we see the promise here. God will punish those who treat his name lightly. That's a promise from scripture. That if you... If you think that God's name is something that you can flippantly throw around and say things like, oh my God, or Jesus Christ, then what God has promised is punishment. Because what that shows is it shows that, that you have not comprehended who God is or who Jesus is or what he has done. And I, I think it's so interesting. I think that this commandment especially of those on that first table of the law. This is a commandment that is so dangerous for us every day. We read these first two commands of no other gods before me and we shall not have any idols and, and we don't see those always as immediately dangerous even though they are. But this command, it smacks us in the face because we are hit with people taking the Lord's name in vain every day. And I'm convinced that this is actually evidence of spiritual warfare. That, that the enemy understands just how great God is and just how great his name is. Yeah. I think the reason that we see people taking God's name in vain is because the enemy is afraid of God's name. Yeah. Because no one stubs their toe and curses the name of Buddha, right? Uh, no, one, no one gets angry and curses Confucius. But it doesn't take long watching TV to hear people take the name of the true and the living God in vain. And, and so we've got to be careful that we aren't discipled by the world to think that, well, I, I don't really mean it, so it's not that big of a deal. Brothers and sisters, God is always a big deal. Right? God's name is always a big deal. Kevin DeYoung is a, a pastor and an author 
And he, he hopefully he gives three categories for us to be aware of, for us to be careful of taking the Lord's name in vain. So we take God's name in vain when we attach it to first what is false. Now, there's some obvious ways that we do this. Like maybe we take, a, take an oath, like to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God, and maybe you intend to lie. Maybe you don't find yourself in that position regularly. I hope you don't find yourself in that position regularly. But there's another way that we attach God's name to what is false. When we use God's name to give our own plans and our own preferences authority, we're using God's name in vain. We say things like, well, God told me to do this. Or God told me to do that. Because we feel strongly about something doesn't mean that we should add God's name to it for added weight. This week, I got to speak to the students on Thursday night of staycation, and uh, we were in Acts 20, and we were talking about, uh, one point, how, how do you know the Lord's will? And we were talking about people doing just this thing. There's always the girl at camp who has the boyfriend who then tells the boyfriend, I just feel like God has told me to break up with you. And, and then he's being broken up with by her, he's being broken up with by the Lord, right? It's just a bad day for that guy. <laughs> right? There's a bad time. When really, man, maybe it's you didn't take a shower all week, right? And that's, that's why she broke up with you, right? That we need to be careful that we don't, we don't say, well, well, God told me to tell you to do this. As a pastor, from time to time, I'll have people come and tell me, hey, God told me that you should do this or you should preach that. And well, until God tells me that, I don't care, right? Uh, uh, I, don't, I don't care w- what you think. I, I care what God's word says. And so we've got to be careful uh, that, that we don't throw around God's name to add weight when really what we're talking about is our preference. Really what we're talking about is, is our own plan. And so we, we take God's name when we attach it to what is false Next, we take God's name when we attach it to what is frivolous. Frivolous is something that lacks seriousness. Jesus warns us against this in uh, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter six, verse seven. He says this, he says, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. It's this vain repetition and, and tossing around God's name carelessly. But when we pray, we should remember who we're praying to. We're not praying to just some other person. We're not praying to a little God. No, we are praying to the high king of heaven, the, the creator of the universe. Rather than thoughtless prayers, we should pray with reverence. But praying and, and using God's name, this, this isn't a hurdle that we clear before we go to sleep or, or before we eat a meal. No, this is a privilege that we're called to. We get to call God's name. We get to come before him and pray to him through Jesus Christ, our mediator and the power of the Holy Spirit. That is a privilege that we shouldn't approach lightly. Another way is using God or Jesus Christ flippantly, frivolously, is curse words or thoughtlessly is fillers or the punchline of a joke. Now, I would imagine that many of us, we know the danger of taking the Lord's name as a curse word. But it always catches me off guard whenever I hear Christians say, oh my God. Or, or when, I, when I hear believers say, Jesus Christ. Right, that's my God too. Right, Jesus Christ died a death that I deserved, that you deserved, to raise us from the grave. Jesus Christ isn't someone that we should throw his name around as if he's just some other person. Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior of the universe. Jesus Christ is coming back one day for his people, and he's going to judge the living and the dead. See, Jesus is a friend of sinners, But that doesn't mean that we should approach him carelessly. No, it means that we should approach him seriously. It means that we should approach him reverently, but it also means that we can approach him boldly. 
So we can approach the throne of grace, understanding that when we come to the throne, we will get grace. But we approach the throne of grace understanding that we need grace, not that we are there because Jesus needs us. Not that we are there because Jesus is looking for someone to worship him. Uh, The scriptures tell us that even if we don't worship, the rocks will cry out, right? Creation declares the glory of God. Jesus doesn't need us, but he invites us to know him and to, to be known by him. And so we take God's name in vain when we attach it to what is false or to what is frivolous. And then finally, we take God's name and we attach it to what is phony. We take God's name and we attach it to what is phony. And the great danger here is phony worship. Do we believe and mean what we sing? Do we worship as if God is worthy or as if he is common? Do do we approach worship as something that we just have to get through until we get to the sermon? Do we approach worship as something that we just have to get through and then we just have to get through the sermon and then we just have to get through the response and then we can get to lunch or we can get to our day or we can get to whatever we need. Here is the thing. We don't have to come to worship. We get to come to worship, right? We get to come in here on Sunday mornings and lift high the name of Jesus, right? The Bible tells us that the Lord inhabits the praises of his people. So whenever we, we come in and we sing and we worship, Right, that the Lord Jesus Christ is present in that place. Now, he's present everywhere, and he's, he's present when you worship at home. He's present when you worship in the car, but what the scriptures tell us is that he is present in a special way, in a unique way, when his people gather together under the authority of his word, and he comes and he inhabits our praises. And so are we engaged in phony worship? I'm convinced there's a, there's a few causes for phony worship. One is we don't think about what we're singing. Right, we just mindlessly repeat the words or maybe we don't sing at all. But when we stop and we consider what it is that we are singing, then we understand just how great our God is. I'm the first to tell you that there are, there are some contemporary Christian songs we shouldn't sing. Right? That they don't deserve to be thought about. They don't, they don't deserve to be sung. But as we sing, we, we, should, we should think about what it is that we're singing. Now, you might say, well, Ethan, I, uh, I just don't like the style of music that we sing sometimes. Well, when we are here to worship you, that will matter, right? <laughs> but we are here to worship God. We're here to worship the King. We're here to worship Him. His preference matters. You know what he tells us? He says, worship in spirit and in truth. Now understand that worship isn't always easy, but God is always worthy. Sometimes I think maybe that we make worship harder on ourselves than it has to be. Right? We we say things like, I'm just always tired on Sundays, and I can't figure out why I'm always tired on Sundays. Well, maybe you're always tired on Sundays because you go to sleep really late on Saturday. There's a there's a saying that that I love, and it's that Sunday morning church is a Saturday night decision. Because if, if, we were, if you were to find out today, or maybe yesterday, that you were going to meet a, a dignitary on Monday, that you're going to meet a king or a queen or the president or whoever, whoever it might be, you would spend the weekend picking out the right, the right wardrobe, right? Maybe you've got to go and you've got to buy, uh, buy a new outfit, you would go and get your hair cut. You, you would think about what is it that I'm going to say? What is it that I'm going to do? You're going to go to sleep early because of the anticipation that's going to be building inside of you. And you want to make sure that you are ready. You're going to leave your house early to make sure that traffic isn't a problem. To make sure that you, you don't just get there on time, but you get there early so that you can go through everything you need to do to make sure that you get a good seat or you get whatever it is so that you can meet the dignitary. But whenever we think about church on Sundays, we think about it as an add-on so often, don't we? It's something that we don't have to be intentional about. See, I think that we make it harder on ourselves. Now, sometimes we have had a hard day, a hard morning, a hard weekend, a hard week, or a, a hard month. And in that moment, we have to fight to remember that God is worthy of our worship. And in In that, when we're in that moment, when we're in that season, whatever it may be, we should prepare our hearts to meet with him. 
that rather than preparing to hear from God's word for the first time whenever we sing the first song, what if on Saturday night, as you went to sleep, you prayed for the worship team? When was the last time you prayed for the tech team so that you could hear clearly? Well, last time, selfishly, you prayed for whoever's gonna be preaching. That the Lord would speak, and the Lord would move. And pray for your own heart that, that you wouldn't be distracted, but that you would be focused. That you would, you would hear God's word. We, we should prepare our hearts to meet with our king. So we cannot separate God's name from God's glory. In the Old Testament, Israel feared using God's name. In fact, that name Yahweh, uh, it's actually more of a symbol than it is God's actual name. It's the tetragrammaton. It's a, uh, it was letters that were used to signal, hey, God's name is being used here. But God's name was too holy to say. God's name was too holy to say. In fact, today, uh, Orthodox Jews will still, when they write God, they will write G-D because his name is so holy and his name is so great. We should, we should take God's name seriously because God takes his name seriously and God has taken his name so seriously that he has said that, that I cannot dwell with sinful men. He, he has said that I will not dwell with sinful men and so what he's done is he has said that someone has to pay the penalty and that penalty for our sin, for my sin and for your sin is death. It's a sinner's death, experiencing all of God's wrath for our sin. But, but here's the good news, that all of that wrath that your sin deserves, that my sin deserves, is poured out on Jesus Christ. That on the cross, Jesus Christ became our sin. Not because he had ever sinned or he had ever experienced sin, but because you and I have sinned and you and I have experienced sin and, and you and I do commit sin. And so on the cross, Jesus became our sin and all of God's wrath was poured out on the cross, on Jesus Christ, in our place. The scriptures tell us that he was buried and he was in the grave for three days and then he rose from the grave. When he rose from the grave, he, he defeated sin and he defeated death. And now because Jesus Christ, our mediator, Paul tells us in Timothy, there's one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is our mediator, we don't fear using God's name. We are invited to use God's name. But we aren't invited to just call him God or Elohim or Yahweh or Adonai. We are invited to call him Father. And the only reason that you and I can call him Father is because of what Jesus Christ has done. Uh, understand this, that apart from Jesus Christ, you can only take the Lord's name in vain. Apart from Jesus Christ, there is no way for you to use God's name in a holy way. There, there is no way for you to use God's name in the right way. And so if you've never trusted Jesus Christ, here is the bad news. You stand condemned before a holy God. You, you stand deserving judgment. You stand deserving hell. But here's the good news. Jesus Christ has come to save you. Jesus Christ has come to forgive you. Here's what I want you to know about me. That apart from Jesus Christ, I deserve hell. Apart from Jesus Christ, I deserve judgment. And yet because of Jesus Christ, we can have forgiveness, we can have freedom, we can have life everlasting. We can have life forevermore. And so if you have yet to trust Jesus, if you have yet to put your hope in your faith, make him your treasure, then today is the day for you to do that. Now, maybe, maybe you're sitting here this morning and you're, you're saying, Ethan, I have trusted Jesus, but, but Ethan, I'm guilty of taking his name in vain. I'm guilty of using his name as something common. Of saying Jesus Christ or oh my God or whatever it may be, here's what I want you to know. What the scriptures tell us in Romans 8, 1 is true that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So because of Jesus, we have forgiveness. But, but understand this, that, 
that the way we take God's name in vain isn't only by saying, but it's also the way we live, right? We talked about this. That oftentimes we fail to live as Christ followers. We, we fail to live worthy of the name that we have been given, worthy of the title that we have been given. And when we do that, we're taking his name in vain. And yet for you, even now, for me, right now, there is grace because of Jesus Christ. We're gonna end this service by praying and by singing. And as we do, uh, we'll have a next steps team down front. And they're here to to pray with you and and to encourage you and to to talk with you and to walk along beside you. And so maybe you're saying, Ethan, I need to trust Jesus Christ. I don't know how to do that. Here's how you trust Jesus. You put your faith and your hope in him. And oftentimes the best way for us to to make that known or to, to understand that is for us to verbalize it. Right, for us to say, God, I know I'm a sinner and I need a savior and I trust that Jesus is that savior that I need. And so, God, I want you to forgive me. I want you to welcome me, not because of what I've done, but in spite of what I've done, because of what Jesus has done. And so maybe you need to pray that prayer today and just ask the Lord to forgive you and to save you. Or maybe you need to pray that prayer today or a prayer like it that says, God, I know that I have failed but I know Jesus has it. And so Lord, remind me of the gospel. Remind me of the good news. So I'm gonna pray and we're gonna sing and our Next Steps team will be down front and I wanna invite you to come. Maybe you don't need to pray with them. Maybe you need to pray with yourself, right? Maybe you just need to humble yourself before the Lord and to ask him to help you to treat him as holy and good. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for your goodness and your grace. Lord, thank you that you are holy and that you are righteous and that you are mighty. Father, thank you that you are worthy. Father, I pray that you would forgive us for where we have treated you lightly, where we have taken your name in vain, whether in the words that we say or the way that we live. But Father, I I pray that you would help us to, to know you and to love you and to treat you as such as the the righteous ruler, judge, king, creator of the universe. And Father, I pray that that we would know your grace and your mercy this morning, that you would forgive us for where we fail. You would forgive us for where we have taken your name in vain, Father, that you would encourage us and you would empower us to live holy lives. So Father, we pray this and we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks again for listening to today's message. Again, we hope that this message blessed you in some way. Now, you've come to church. Go be the church. Have a great week of worship.